All right, let's take a look at the uh, second half of this uh, presentation on protests and action uh, against the apartheid movement. We left off on the Alexander bus boycott, and let's continue. And so the ANC split, the African National Congress split in 1959. The Africanists within the ANC had a different view. They hoped for liberation through political self-reliance and a focus on African traditions. So they just wanted uh, to kind of uh, just uh, keep it within the ANC. Uh, they didn't like these alliances with other groups. And they also had some extreme views, including the belief that all land in South Africa should be returned to its original black owners and all white people should leave completely. Uh, the very first guy that really pushes these ideas is uh, Anton Lembede, who dies in 1947, but he's very influential on these two guys, uh, Robert uh, Subique and Potlakos Lebalo. And uh, Subukwe and Lebalo were disillusioned with the ANC's work with a non-African groups, including the white communists and a lot of the other non-African groups, uh, including like the Indian National Congress. Uh, so the treason trial removed some of the top leadership. So with the treason trial of 56, Mandela and Sasulu are out. And so this is a little bit of power vacuum. This is their chance to jump in. And so the Africanists, they're, they're a small group, they're not the majority at all, but they see this chance. So in 1958, they start to challenge some of the tr some of the usual ANC strategies. They come out against the ANC's stay-at-home campaign. And uh, overall, in the white media, they're, they're very approved. And they label these two guys, Sobekwe and Lebala, as the respectable basis of black political opinion. Uh, which is going to be odd, because uh, these guys are going to cause some trouble later down the line. Africanists, uh, they also went on to attempt to break up some of the other meetings, the provincial or like statewide ANC conference chaired by Oliver Tambo. So they, they go in and try to kind of take over that. And after they fail at taking over that meeting, they decide to leave the ANC and start their own thing. And so they form the Pan-African Congress. Sorry, Pan-Africanist Congress. Uh, led by Sobekwe and formed in early 1959. Their strategy is pretty much to hijack and uh, take over ANC campaigns for their own benefits to focus on black issues only. And so the big example was that the ANC planned on a series of past law protests. And so they'd start this in March, and then by June, this would end in a huge bonfire of all these passes that collected. So June 1960, they had this huge fire of passes. PAC responds is saying, basically, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to have our own anti-pass protest, and we're going to do it three days before you start yours. So it looked like it was our idea. So days before their own protests. And so the PAC planned on thousands of protesters showing up at police stations without their passbooks, demanding to be arrested at these police stations, so to hopefully just crowd out and uh, drown the system and people willing to be arrested. The police, uh, they warned the police, they sent letters to the police saying, hey, on this day, we're going to show up to be arrested, get ready. So the police got ready. And so they fortified all their stations. They got ready for hey, the possibility that these crowds might be armed. And so these stations are ready for war. All armed police are on, on alert, ready to go. However, the, the pack is not calling for violence. They're urging nonviolence. Uh, but that just uh, is not going to be enough. This leads to the Sharpeville Massacre. So all these people show up to be arrested. March 21st, 1960. 5,000 demonstrators in particular wait in a field just outside the police station of Sharpeville. And the crowd is very peaceful. They're singing freedom songs. They're chanting political slogans. Uh, no signs of violence. And the crowd starts to move closer and closer to the fence surrounding the police station saying, hey, can you arrest us? And here's where the story gets tricky. According to police reports, there was a fight between an armed protester and a police officer. The crowd moved forward, surged forward to see the fight, to see what was happening between this protester that apparently had a gun and the officer. Protesters at this point start to throw rocks at the police. However, the protesters that were there, the 5,000 witnesses, say that didn't happen, the, that there was no fight that took place. And so we're, we're getting two conflicting stories as far as how this started. Uh, 
what we do know is a policeman started to worry that they were going to be overrun. One person opened fire, at which point all other officers opened fire in a sustained, constant volley of gunfire that lasts over two minutes. So there's no official order to start, just somebody freaks out, and it uh, lets loose for two minutes nonstop of firing. By the end of this thing, 69 people are killed on the spot, including 8 women, 10 children, and there are 186 people that are injured. Uh, nearly everyone was shot in the back as they were trying to run away. And so up here in this picture we have people uh, running away, and then down here we have a picture of the funeral with all the coffins and those that died on the spot. So now we have the reaction to this pretty bad massacre. Uh, most non-whites are pretty outraged and pretty angry by the event and government reaction as far as they, they are, this is pretty extreme. The Prime Minister completely denies any of this. Prime Minister of Edwards says that, uh, and tells his National Party supporters that most Africans are peaceful. They support his policies of grand apartheid and separate development. But it's, the, it's that evil ANC and the PAC that help had coerced the protesters into marching. So it's, the, it's specifically the ANC that is encouraging these evil acts of protest. However, things didn't get better after the uh, massacre. There were continued clashes with the police across the country. The violence kept getting worse and worse and worse, and people are rising up. And this is not violence led by the ANC or the PAC. So by March 30th, just uh, a week later, the government shuts everything down with a state of emergency. Thousands of ANC and PAC leaders are arrested on the spot, and by April 8, 1960, the Unlawful Organiza Organizations Act bans, uh, passed banning the ANC and the PAC. So these, they can no longer meet, all the leaders are gone, and the military is in full force shutting down any protests. And so this liberation movement, this liberation and pro-democracy movement, now moves underground for the rest of, well, for the next few decades. Uh, for a while, we have fugitive Nelson Mandela. Mandela's on the run, and there's a warrant for his arrest, and he convinces the ANC it's time to get violent. Peace has only taken them so far, so it's time to begin an armed resistance. And so they begin the Mkonto Wesizwe, the MK. And this is created to start acts of sabotage against the South African government. So they're not looking to kill anybody. They don't want to injure anybody. But they'd like to send a message and slow down the government by committing acts of violent sabotage against government buildings and things like that. But they're not looking to hurt anybody. They're looking to send messages and slow down the government. It's a major turning point for the ANC in that uh, they're not going to be moderate anymore. And so moderates like Chief Lathuli become more radical, more extreme, because civil disobedience wasn't working, and because the government just was designed and set up to shut down all forms of protest. This was a, a well-planned South African apartheid government. Uh, even the power to use armed forces against protesters. If they wanted to kill the protesters, they could. If they wanted to whip protesters, they could. So it's a pretty extreme. The ANC is officially banned. So negotiations are no longer possible. So even if they were peaceful, they're not going to get anywhere with this. They're not even allowed to talk. Plus, if they didn't make a change, the PAC was going to take over. And that they have a rival with the PAC. The PAC even creates their own armed wing, the POCO. And so here's uh, Subikwe getting ready with his POCO. And so they had to change, or the POCO, the POCO is going to take over. So they create their own armed wing, and they discuss this for a while, especially the more young, radical guys, like Mandela, Sisulu, Tambo, and Nzo. Uh, these guys have been ready hey, for a fight for a while. The younger guys tend to be. In uh, 1953, Mandela was already thinking about this, and then he developed a series of plans just in case. If the ANC was banned, he wanted to have a backup plan. And one of those things is called the M plan in which they would dissolve the centralized African National Congress to create a bunch of small sleeper cells to wage guerrilla war. So they'd pretty much dissolve their kind of big group and then kind of go on a rampage in smaller groups with acts of sabotage to continue the fight in other ways. Uh, but uh, by the 1960s, the world starts to turn against South Africa, especially after Sharpeville. 
And so February 1960, Harold Macmillan, who's the UK Prime Minister, he is speaking, about to give his Winds of Change speech in Cape Town, where he argues that it's, it's time to change, it's time to give up apartheid, and he says that the nationalist demands of Africans would eventually have to be met. And this is around the time where England really starts to give up all of their colonies and say it's time to give people democracy. And so he's kind of giving a warning saying, hey guys, it's probably time to give black people the right to vote. The world Across the world, we start to see economic sanctions. People start to boycott South Africa. However, the UK and the USA don't join UK and USA because they're best friends. And uh, UK still wants to have this strong alliance in Africa. And so they stick around for a little while. It takes a while for the UK and the USA finally to boycott South Africa. Uh, a lot of the newly independent states like India st decide that South Africa is going crazy and they force South Africa out of the British Commonwealth to take a vote and kick them out. At which point South Africa decides, fine, we will become a completely independent republic. We are no longer part of the, part of the monarchy. Queen's out. We are a republic. And we're going to maintain a white government in this case. And finally, the last step to shut everything down is the Rivonia trial. This is named after the suburb of Johannesburg where the residents, uh, res resistance movement's safe house, uh, Lily's Leaf Farm is. So here it is, and it's now a World Heritage Site. It's a museum now. But this is their safe house. This is where they were hiding out, this little series of houses. And so it was used by the leaders of the ANC and uh, the SACP, the Colored People Congress, while they were on the run. This is also the headquarters for the MK, uh, the violent group led by Mandela. But eventually Mandela is arrested in 62. He was stopped by police. He was uh, disguised as a chauffeur driving into Johannesburg. And so he got five years in prison for leaving his country without permission, but also inciting strike action. So these little things like being in the wrong place, wrong time had gotten much more extreme, especially for a leader like Mandela. The MK was then passed on to Walter Sisulu and leading white communists. They're planning everything in this kind of a little community, the Lily's, Lily's League Farm community. One year later, the farm is raided uh, by the, sp the special forces. So they rush in, they arrest these top leaders, they find whatever documents they can to prove that these guys are trying to commit treason. And so Walter Sisulu Kovan Mubeki, Raymond Mihab, Melaba, uh, Lionel Bernstein, Ahmed Kahrada, Arthur Goldreich, and Dennis Goldberg are all arrested at the farm, including they also found plans for Operation Mayiboy, and these were the plans for the Revolutionary Guerrilla War waged from the bases in rural areas, so kind of part of Plan M from 1953. So with all these guys arrested and with evidence right there that they were planning acts of sabotage, these guys are put on trial for treason. Mandela is brought out of jail to be put on trial with them. So this is the Rivonia trial, charged with the Sabotage Act of 1962, which is now a capital offense. So for, so for committing sabotage, for blowing up a post office, they can now execute you. Uh, they argued that they had carried out these acts of sabotage, so they do admit they had committed acts of sabotage, they'd blown up government things. And the government was saying that, uh, that they were blowing up things, committing acts of sabotage, that endangered human life. And they planned to use violence to, cr to create a revolution and overthrow the state. All defendants said, yes, we were using sabotage, but nobody was actually in danger, no lives were endangered. And the defendants hoped that they could make this a show trial. They hoped to politicize the trial by arguing that their struggle was on behalf of the people for freedom and democracy against racial domination and oppression. The defendants condemned the extreme and harsh responses of the government that forced them to turn and forced them to turn to armed resistance and sabotage in pursuit of these higher ideals. It's a very risky strategy in that they are saying, yes, we, we committed this crime, we committed sabotage, hoping that they would get press and publicity to change world opinion. Mandela could have just argued, hey, I was in jail while this was happening. I was in jail while you passed the Sabotage Act, therefore I didn't break the Sabotage Act because I was in jail. He could have just used that defense and he likely would have just uh, gotten out a couple of years. 
However, he decides to stand with his guys, and he says, no, I was the leader of the NK MK while I was in jail. So he, he goes for it. The trial ends in June of 64. Reporters around the world show up. They're listening, ready to hear what's going to happen. The international campaign against the trial is led in London from ANC members in exile. June 9th, the UN Security Council meets and passes a resolution calling for the South African government to end it and just offer amnesty for the accused. Just let them go. Four countries on the council decide to abstain because they didn't want to uh, alienate their allies. So the USA, France, Brazil, and the UK just uh, don't vote, but they also don't vote against it. And so the resolution passes. They just uh, aren't ready to kind of quite support the resolution, but they're not ready to fight it either. June 11th, a Justice Cordes DeWitt delivers his verdict. Guilty. All except for Lionel Bernstein. So they, out of the 12 guys, one is released. Then they have the death penalty hearing. At the death penalty hearing, uh, anti-apartheid author and Liberal Party leader Alan Payton uh, who wrote uh, Cry the Beloved Countries, a, a great book about apartheid, you should read it, and it was called to testify to appeal for clemency, to say, so he's a kind of a main white leftist leader, and so he shows up to say, hey, just kind of, uh, these guys should live. And he argues that the judge should spare their lives for the good of the country, otherwise the country might explode in violence. So the judge decides to sentence them to life in prison. Uh, they are sent to Robin Island, which is a maximum security prison, an island just off the coast of Cape Town. Dennis Goldberg is sent to a whites-only prison. Consequences of the trial? The ANC and the MK are broken. Uh, they, they are pretty much fallen apart at this point. Their leaders are all gone. They're banned, in prison, or in exile. So the ANC is just falling apart. And the townships are going to remain quiet for a decade without leadership, and after that nasty bit of violence, the people are quiet until the Soweto Uprising of 76. So for 10 years, nothing. Uh, whites will vote for the National Party in record numbers. The National Party is going to maintain their power hold. Oliver Tambo becomes the new AMP, uh, AMC leader he, while he's in exile in Zambia. So he just crosses the border and continues the fight across the border, but he can't do much. Uh, but he'll just be kind of the leader out there. Mandela, however, he's going to become an idol for South African apartheid opponents, and he starts to grace posters and becomes a symbol around the planet. And we do see new political movements rising up that are going to be created with renewed energy and focus. So Steve Biko's South African Students Organization starts up, and his Black Consciousness Movement of the 60s and 70s starts to rise up. And later on in the 80s, we get the United Democratic Front. So this is not the end. But we do see a break in the resistance against apartheid. And we'll stop there.